This is the module on the history of the training of the surgeon. My name is Justin Barr. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. The surgical training you are about to enter in the 21st century is a highly organized, regimented process with strict rules on the number of years it will last, hours you can work, and the number of procedures you must complete to attain competency. But it was not always this way. Over the next 10 minutes or so, we will explore how surgeons have been educated, briefly reviewing the ancient, medieval, and early modern worlds before narrowing our focus to the more recent American story. Here are some questions to consider before embarking on this module. Ancient surgeons learned through apprenticeships. The Hippocratic Oath explicitly forbade operating and surgeons were, at least in theory, distinct from physicians. Medical texts flourished in the ancient world and authors like Hippocrates and Galen often included some content on surgery, but their focus remained on medical interventions, not operative. The first text dedicated solely to surgery did not appear until the seventh century, several hundred years after the fall of the Roman Empire, when Paul of Aegina published the sixth volume of his classic encyclopedia. It remained a reference for over a thousand years and provided a textual foundation for apprentices otherwise learning almost entirely from experience. Ancient Greek and Roman knowledge filtered through Arabia arrived back in medieval Europe around the year 1000 CE. Universities arose to help teach medicine, but with few exceptions, surgeons did not have access to this formal schooling and the resulting MD degree. Apprenticeships, often to fathers, continued to train the vast majority of surgeons. Importantly, a textual tradition in surgery did arise, demanding a theoretical foundation for what had previously been a mostly empiric practice. In the introduction of a seminal text, 13th century surgeon Bruno insisted, surgeons should be literate men. I scarcely believe anyone can master this art if he cannot read. Literacy, today such a basic element of surgical education so as not even to merit consideration, was a major step forward for medieval surgical training. The early modern period saw the beginning of formal didactic education for surgeons as they began to attend classes at universities in subjects like anatomy, pathology, and receive the MD degree. Professional organizations like the Royal College of Surgeons in England created official surgical communities by the 1700s, defining who was a surgeon through board-like examinations and educational requirements. At this point, the American and European stories diverge, and we will focus our attention on the United States. The strict separation between physicians and surgeons that existed in Europe never took hold in the United States, and from the time of the nation's first medical school, the University of Pennsylvania, MDs practiced surgery. Medical schools were not required, however, and apprenticeship remained a common educational pathway. Moreover, the poor quality of medical schools hardly guaranteed competence. Hundreds of diploma mills churned out doctors, profit profiting from tuition payments but not educating their students who often graduated in two years without ever having seen a patient. The early 20th century saw the reformation of undergraduate medical education, catalyzed by the 1910 Flexner Report. Medical schools standardized, with four-year curricula divided into the traditional two years of basic science and two years of clinical clerkships. Training beyond medical school was neither required nor frequently pursued. Many medical school graduates simply opened an office and began seeing patients performing minor surgery. Leaders in American surgery often traveled to Europe, especially Germany, for graduate training, but this course was obviously unavailable to the majority of medical practitioners in the United States. These same leaders who had traveled abroad for their own education recognized the need for a training system here in America to prepare both future academicians and community surgeons. William Halstead was one of these leaders. Son of a New York businessman, he attended medical school and completed an internship in New York before spending two years studying surgery in Germany. He returned and eventually became chair at Johns Hopkins. Along with his colleague, William Osler, the chair of medicine, Halstead adopted and adapted the Germanic system of training physicians, thus creating the first residency. While establishing the foundation for modern surgical training, Halstead's program differed substantially from today's residencies. 
He usually accepted eight interns each year, only four of which were promoted to the PGY2 level. Every resident worked under a one-year contract. No one was promised more than 12 months. There was no orderly progression from PGY2 until chief, and promotion depended on competence and favoritism, not seniority. It was a pyramidal system with only a single chief resident who served a variable number of years. While most of Halstead's trainees thus did not complete residency, leaving early in the 1910s and 20s was hardly a dishonor or a disgrace, as these men were still among the best trained surgeons in the country and quickly found prominent academic positions. Halstead's graduates were tremendously successful. Many went on to pioneer subspecialties like urology, neurosurgery, operative orthopedics, and ENT. Others became chair at a host of institutions around the country where they subsequently founded residency programs analogous to the one at Hopkins. Surgeons like Alan Whipple at Columbia and Evarts Graham at Washington University, while not products of the Halsteadian residencies themselves, nonetheless modeled training at their institutions after Halstead's system. By the 1930s, most academic medical centers had established a Halsteadian surgical residency and American surgeons no longer had to travel abroad for their schooling. The original Halsteadian residency founded surgical training in this country, but at the same time, it produced only a few dozen highly trained academic surgeons each year, crucial for medical schools and medical progress, but obviously insufficient for supplying the surgical needs of the country where GPs with a year of internship still provided the vast majority of appendectomies, hernia repairs, and other minor procedures. During the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, surgical residencies expanded from the academic Halstedian model to one applicable to both academia and community practice. Hospitals came to recognize the advantages of house staff as cheap, educated labor, and hundreds of programs sprouted around the country, providing varying qualities of education. Professional organizations like the American College of Surgeons, American Medical Association, and American Board of Surgery recognized the importance of postgraduate training. While realizing that health study and programs were neither possible nor appropriate everywhere, they also grew concerned over the proliferation of inferior residencies. Each organization created a set of standards residencies must meet, established an inspection service to ensure compliance, and published a list of approved programs. Factors like diverse clinical experience, didactic and basic science education, and research opportunities helped distinguish strong programs from weak ones. In the mid-1950s, the three organizations united to form the Residency Review Committee, which continues today inspecting and improving programs based on an agreed-upon set of criteria. World War II catalyzed the spread of residencies around the country. The military gave promotions, pay raises, and preferred assignments to board-certified surgeons, generating instant interest in certification and thus the schooling required to achieve it. The post-war VA system further galvanized the rise of graduate medical education. Newly linked to academic medical centers, it also created hundreds of new residency positions, many funded by the federal government. Also rewarding board certification with higher pay, the VA promoted residency training at an economic level as well. Between official incentives offered by the government, academic, and private institutions alike, personal desire of clinicians to improve, and a general cultural shift in medicine, residencies became de rigueur in post-war America. In World War II, over 60% of the surgeons in the Army had not completed residency. By the mid-1950s, practically every new surgeon in the United States had completed a residency analogous to the one you are about to enter. Residency, as formulated in the 1950s, did not change significantly in structure through the second half of the 20th century. The advent of medical insurance and the eventual establishment of Medicare and Medicaid in the 1960s eliminated many of the charity patients who had previously received much of their clinical care from residents. The number of patients seeking surgical care rose, demanding larger training programs. Medicare also fostered a series of bureaucratic regulations demanding increasing attending involvement in the care of patients at teaching hospitals. Furthermore, Medicare provided salaries to residents who, in prior years, received little more than room and board, allowing house staff to get married and start families. 
As operations became more complex, fellowships, essentially non-existent through the 1960s, became common by the 1990s, further lengthening training. Culture also shifted in the 1960s and 1970s. Nationally, public unrest over Vietnam, civil rights, and Watergate roiled the nation. In medicine, house staff expressed their dissatisfaction with working conditions and burnout, with expedited patient turnover, increased disease severity, and technology distancing doctors from their patients. Some residents even formed unions and went on strike. Much of the cynicism of the area was captured in Shem's classic comedy, House of God. In 1984, a young woman named Libby Zion was admitted to New York Hospital. She died shortly thereafter from cardiac arrest. Despite recently returning from vacation and being less than 24 hours into their shift, overworked residents were blamed for her death for prescribing interacting medications. Zion's death spawned the Bell Commission, named after its founder, which, among other recommendations, suggested the 80-hour work week. Though many leading surgeons vigorously fought the measure through the 1990s and early 2000s, it has since become nationally mandated and a prominent feature of modern GME. Today, surgical residency faces both opportunities and challenges. Duty hours, the complex interplay between community and academic hospitals, now often part of the same healthcare system, increasing demands of attending oversight, electronic medical records, and ever-expanding technology have all affected residencies both positively and negatively in the 21st century, with the impact of the Affordable Care Act yet to be seen. General surgery training has become increasingly fractured. In the early 20th century, specialties like urology, ophthalmology, ENT, orthopedics, and neurosurgery split off from general surgery to form their own residencies. More recently, plastics, cardiothoracic, and vascular surgery have done the same through I-5 and I-6 programs. As early specialization pathways become increasingly common and a global 3-3 structure discussed as a possible framework going forward, the future of general surgery residency is uncertain. But the training of the surgeon, in whatever guise it may take, remains secure.